that low level movement and that constant simulation of, you know, AMPK and these different pathways um, is is very important for kind of keeping the body constitutively moving through glucose as opposed to just chunking it in one exercise block, um, which of course is going to be very different physiology than low grade movement throughout the entire day. And I really like to think about it as like you have you can either constantly be triggering these pathways to keep working, keep bringing the, the glute forward, you know, keep, keep bringing glute forward to the cell membrane all throughout the day, or you can chunk it. And ideally we'd have intense exercise in a chunk, but also this low grade movement, uh, throughout the day. So I think that's one of like the biggest takeaways I've seen from both the levels data, but also just like the general research literature about, about walking. <laughs> This episode was sponsored by Element, that's pronounced Element, spelled L-M-N-T. I love this. I am in hot Houston, Texas. And by the way, when I moved here, nobody told me that summers were like 104 degrees. I am sweating everywhere. You just walk outside. You have to replace and replenish fluids. But again, you don't want to just utilize water. You want to use electrolyte ratios because we don't just sweat out water. We do sweat out sodium. Element is a science-backed electrolyte packet, and it has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. I am really into the watermelon salt. It is great for summer. It is great iced. It doesn't have any junk. It doesn't have any sugar, no coloring, nothing artificial. Amazing. I'm using it before and after I ice bath. Yes, believe it or not, I am obsessed with it. It's been around for a long time and you can get eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try all eight different flavors. You can share it with a friend. So go to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. That's drink element.com slash Dr. Lion. And if you don't like it, they offer a no questions asked refund. So it's totally risk-free. Dr. Casey Means, thank you so much for coming on the show. I am very excited to talk to you about all things blood sugar related, ENT, your transition from conventional medicine to more well-rounded, no offense, medicine. Tell me a little bit about how you got here. So now you are traditionally trained as an ear, nose, and throat physician. That's right. Dr. Lyons, it's so great to see you today. I'm so I'm so thrilled to be on your podcast. And uh, yeah, happy to tell you a little bit about, about the journey briefly. I, I trained as an ear, nose, and throat, had a neck surgeon. Um, I did my medical school at Stanford. And then I went to Oregon uh, Health and Science University up in Portland, Oregon for ENT training. And it was really interesting. I was about... I was just starting my fifth and final year of uh, surgical residency. And I had this like total wake up call. It was almost like an out of body experience actually, where uh, I was doing, I think it was like my third sinusitis surgery of the day. And I think this person had been in for like two or three surgeries. She, it was like a multiple revision sinusitis surgery. And I just kind of, kind of realized like, it's so I, I do this all day, every day, but like I don't actually really think that this surgery that I'm doing right now is going to actually like fix the problem or make this person actually healthier. She had like prediabetes, she was overweight, she had high cholesterol, she had all these other issues. And I just sort of felt like, you know, I can just keep busting holes in these sinuses all day, but like, am I really actually making this person fundamentally healthier? And like, what are the actual chances that uh, this sinusitis that she has and has had multiple um, bouts of and revision surgeries is actually like completely unrelated to all these other more chronic metabolic conditions that she has. And just kind of just sitting there like nine years into medical training being like, I don't really feel like I understand the full picture of what's going on with this patient in front of me. And that was really, you know, eye opening. And it really sent me down this road of digging into more of like the root causes, um, into what was really driving the physiology and the patients I was seeing. And one of the big wake up calls for me was that I kind of realized that every single condition I was treating as an ENT surgeon was inflammatory in nature. And so 
obviously like the suffix itis in in medicine is inflammation. And if you think about like what an ENT doctor treats, it's like sinusitis, otitis, mastitis, laryngitis, parotitis, cellulitis. It's so much itis. And I was like, oh my God, I'm an inflammation doctor. And I didn't really realize it. And so much of the tools we use in ear, nose and throat are actually to just like quell the immune system. So it's it's incredible how many types of steroids we can use. It's like IV steroids, topical steroids, oral steroids, inhaled steroids, nasal steroids. And so basically what I was doing in my field was treating inflammatory conditions with these heavy hammer steroid medications, but never, ever being asked to think about what was actually causing that inflammation in the body. And when I was started going down that that journey of being obsessed with figuring out why do these patients have so much inflammation? Like we never, ever, 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 ever ask why. It led me directly to metabolic health and really an obsession with mitochondrial function and metabolic health. Because when you think about a cell that is essentially under threat, it is going to release chemical mediators to recruit help. And that help is going to come from inflammatory cells and the immune system. And so, so you got to then say, okay, well, what is, why is a cell releasing these fear signals, these threat, you know, mediators to try and recruit help from the immune system? And what is the problem that that cell is facing that actually is causing it to be chronically sending out alarm systems and therefore chronically rubbing up the immune system? And why is it ever is it why isn't it ever actually resolving? Like why is it not acute inflammation? Why is it becoming chronic inflammation? And that pathway basically led me to realizing that the threat is actually inside the cell. It's the fact that the cell is underpowered. It's metabolically dysfunctional. The mitochondria is essentially uh, dysfunctional, as we know in most American bodies at this point, the majority of American adults have metabolic dysfunction. And so it's this sad situation where you've got these cells in the body that are underpowered because of mitochondrial dysfunction. They're sending out these alert signals to recruit the immune system, but the immune system can't actually help because the problem that the cell is threatened by is inside of it. So all of this journey essentially um, got me to actually leave the surgical world and leave ENT and devote my life to the metabolic health crisis and essentially become a warrior to try and help people improve their mitochondrial function. And what I've come to realize and understand is that the things that are synergistically crushing our mitochondrial function and essentially creating underpowered cells that are experiencing the sense of threat, um, it's, it's the way we're living in our modern world. It's, it's all these different environmental factors that synergistically work to hurt different elements of our uh, ability to make energy in the body processly, pro- uh, properly and synergistically through all these different uh, different ways, essentially causing mitochondrial dysfunction. This, of course, ranges from, ranges from our sedentary behavior, our being under-muscled, our uh, ultra-processed or fine diet, our lack of micronutrients in the diet, our the 80,000-plus environmental toxins uh, that have entered our air, water, food, homes over the past 50 years, uh, getting lack of sunlight during the day, um, not sleeping enough, chronic low-grade stress, all these different environmental factors. And uh, and so that's where I'm at now. And that is what inspired me to ultimately start uh, the company that I co-founded called Levels, which is right in the center of this whole, this whole uh, ecosystem that I'm talking about, which is helping people understand their own metabolic health. Uh, understand their own blood sugar levels, which are, of course, one of the readouts of metabolic health, and then learn to optimize them through really uh, holistic uh, uh, approaches that uh, that uh, that impact all those different vectors that I was just mentioning. It's pretty incredible. For those of you who are not physicians who are listening, ear, nose, and throat is a very competitive specialty. Individuals that are, go into ear, nose, and throat have typically done, um, you know, they're top of their class. It is extremely competitive. You have to be published. It is extraordinarily rigorous. You put in nine years into that and then you left to advocate for a mission that you believe deeply in. I am sure that that was met with some backlash in your life and your family probably thought you were a bit crazy at first because everyone that is an innovator individuals often uh, say that they're crazy until they figure out that they are right. And levels, it's, it's so fascinating. This idea of glucose regulation is critical 
for everybody, including the provider. When we think about how do we regulate blood glucose, there are multiple ways to regulate low levels of blood glucose, whether it's the hormonal response versus the catecholamine response versus there is one way that the body has to regulate endogenously elevated levels of blood glucose, and that's insulin. And ultimately, the issues that you are talking about as it relates to insulin resistance are critical and and probably at the root cause of nearly all of the things. And from a physician perspective, I think about it as food, drugs, exercise. And you have become very skilled at looking at, I would say, probably all three of those things. And in particular, when it relates to blood sugar, what are some of the things that we see from a practical aspect that contribute to, well, number one, we should start with, why is the variability in blood sugar not ideal? The ebbs and flows of blood sugar not ideal. Great question. So so variability refers to essentially how much our blood sugar is going up and down through out the day. And what's starting to be uncovered in in the research literature is that when the swings in glucose, like a big up after a meal and then a big crash, that 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 big swing is actually uh, independently associated with the future risk of type 2 diabetes and premature mortality. Even if your fasting blood sugar is normal and you don't actually meet the pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetes range. So, so glucose variability is independently associated with worst outcomes, no matter what bucket you fall into based on standard diagnostic criteria. So we want to essentially move towards, or the research is starting to suggest that we want to move towards much lower ups and downs in our blood sugar throughout the day, as opposed to these big peaks and valleys. And one of the amazing papers that really, I think, helped solidify this uh, in a non-diabetic population was Michael Schneider out of Stanford. He wrote uh, a paper um, about what he called glucotypes, which are essentially how do you take people who are non-diabetic or in the pre-diabetes range, put continuous glucose monitors on them. So this tool that you can wear on your arm that essentially can show you a movie of your glucose throughout the day, as opposed to just like single time point measurements that of course would not show you variability. So a continuous glucose monitor can actually show you this movie of the ups and downs. And he put these sensors on people and showed that you can kind of bucket people into three different categories, low variability, medium variability, and high variability. And And that was for people who might not have any diagnosis, again, of diabetes, but even just someone like, you know, you know, just take five ostensibly healthy non-diabetic people, they could fall into these different buckets of how high their blood sugar was going up and down throughout the day. And he showed that when you correlate that with other metabolic biomarkers that we care about, like fasting insulin, hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, triglyceride levels, that essentially they basically got worse for all, for every biomarker as you went from low variability to high variability. So there's a strong correlation between overall metabolic biomarkers that we know are predictive of future cardiometabolic diseases and high variability. So that doesn't really get at the chicken and the egg, like which one is causing which, but what it basically shows is that there's an association with variability and poor health outcomes. He also showed that Um, based on our standard diagnostic criteria, which of course is like fasting glucose and oral glucose tolerance tests and um, hemoglobin A1C, those are the three ways that we would basically diagnose someone with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, that actually if you put a continuous glucose monitor on someone and looked at their variability, he showed that people were reaching prediabetic levels of glucose uh, 15 uh, percent of the time, um, even if they were totally normal by other criteria. So you're probably able to catch a lot of people with early metabolic issues if you're able to see variability that you're going to miss if you just do the standard diagnostic criteria. And some evidence is starting to show that this variability might actually be an early sign of insulin resistance, like that we could catch it through variability before fasting glucose starts to change. And the reason for that is because as you become more insulin resistant and your cells are starting to put up this block due to you know underlying mitochondrial dysfunction, intracellular lipids, all these things that are blocking the insulin signal from 
you know, essentially um, from being transmitted within the cell and then causing the body to compensatorily increase its insulin levels. As that process is happening, the fasting glucose is still going to look normal because the body is basically becoming insulin resistant. It's overproducing insulin to basically overcome that block. And that works for a little while. So you're hyperinsulinemic and fasting glucose looks okay. But that person is may start to have issues clearing glucose out of the bloodstream after a meal. So let's say you eat a high carb meal and your glucose spikes, their peak might be higher and it might take longer to actually get all that glucose load out of the bloodstream into the cell because there's that early insulin resistance. So by actually looking at variability, you might be able to kind of pick up some nuances about difficulties clearing glucose, i.e. early insulin resistance, before the fasting glucose actually gets to the pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic range. So that's that's really why variability um, is starting to emerge as something really important. And we're at a time now where continuous glucose monitors are gaining awareness amongst practitioners and consumers and patients. And so there's, we're kind of in this interesting time where both the research and the landscape of access to technology are meeting up. And I think it's going to be really exciting for like future diagnostic potential, but also for potentially like pre-diabetes reversal strategies and things like that. But it has certainly not made it into like mainstream um, guidelines yet. That is absolutely fascinating. Eventually, I believe that it will be a tool that is utilized so much more frequently for exactly those reasons that you're speaking about. If we can do early intervention, then we can actually change the trajectory. And at precisely what you said, you know, there's a discussion, is it skeletal muscle insulin resistance? Is it liver insulin resistance? You know, there's there's three main sites that insulin really works on. We think about muscle, we think about liver, we think about adipose tissue. Is there uh, impact on the brain? Of course, but ultimately, when we have issues with glucose homeostasis, over time, insulin resistance creates a whole host of very significant issues including elevated levels of triglyceride, increase in circulating free fatty acids. You know, there, there are multiple issues. When we measure fasting blood glucose, you mentioned that potentially the, quote, normal ranges are a bit high. Is there a target that you like to see that the collective data likes to look at um, that would be not normal but optimal? Mm. Great question. I, from reviewing the literature of essentially how risk for future diseases shows up based on where you are on the fasting glucose spectrum, and also just from really talking to so many like experts in the space who are who are sort of metabolically savvy physicians, so merging expert opinion and also the research literature, it really seems like the optimal fasting glucose range is between about 70 and 85 milligrams to deciliter. And as you now, and for, for people um, who may not be practitioners listening, so anything less than 100 milligrams to deciliter is considered non diabetic for fasting glucose. So you walk into the doctor's office, and let's say your fasting glucose is 97 milligrams to deciliter. I'd say nine times out of 10, the doctor's not even going to mention it. They're just going to say, oh, yeah, 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 you're totally fine. You're normal. Um, metabolic stuff looks good. Uh, and it's a huge disservice to the patient because if you actually look at the curves uh, and the odds ratios and the risk ratios of getting future type 2 diabetes, developing obesity, developing ischemic uh, or, th or thromboembolic stroke, premature all-cause mortality, it's J-shaped curves for all of these where basically uh, – the lowest risk is around 70 to 85 milligrams per deciliter. And then it goes up sharply as your fasting glucose goes between about 85 milligrams per deciliter and 100 milligrams per deciliter. And then, of course, it goes up even higher as you go into the prediabetes range and the type 2 diabetes range. But we're basically telling those people who are on the upswing, the early upswing of that curve for future risk, that they're totally normal. When actually, I'd much rather be at the the nadir of that curve, um, and it is actually important to to mention that it is a J shaped curve. So it it below seventy milligrams per deciliter, you actually do see kind of an uptick of future risk of uh, of various cardiometabolic diseases, which I think is really interesting. And so that's why I said, you know, some people ask, 
well, is lower better? Like, should we shoot for 60 milligrams per deciliter? And in the current research that exists, there are quite a few J-shaped curves where at the lower range, it actually goes up. And the certain authors have speculated on why. And the thought is maybe that as you get towards those lower glucose levels for fasting, it's almost like a stress signal to the body that may be releasing catecholamines and actually creating sort of more of stress physiology in the body, which can also hurt mitochondrial function. But what I, and and I'm just saying this more conjecture, I don't know for sure, but I think that if someone is metabolically flexible and is actually really adept at, you know, their bodies are really primed for fat oxidation and they can use other substrates for ATP production um, other than glucose, I actually think you'd probably find that people with a fasting glucose lower than 70 are not going to have increased risk of mortality because we see a lot of people on a ketogenic diet or a higher fat diet who tend to fall into those lower ranges for fasting glucose. And I'm not getting a signal from knowing these patients or, or, or what their other beta- metabolic biomarkers are that they're, that they're probably at higher risk. So I think if you take someone who's not metabolically flexible, really dependent on glucose oxidation for ATP production, and all of a sudden throw them into a glucose level of 60 that could be a stress signal on the body. But I would guess that for someone who's really metabolically flexible, that it's actually um, probably not. not. So, um, But based on what the literature says, I would say 70 to 85 milligrams per deciliter is probably going to be associated with the lowest risk of future chronic diseases in terms of fasting glucose. And that's certainly, certainly what I shoot for. And um, one last thing I'll note is that if you are checking your fasting glucose every day, either with a finger prick or a continuous glucose monitor, a lot of people will find that it bounces around aggressively day to day. So if I am just like completely on point with all my health vectors, so I'm lifting, I'm walking, I'm doing zone two, I'm getting quality, consistent sleep, I'm you know eating a whole foods, low glycemic diet, getting my protein, not eating late at night, my fasting glucose could easily be 70 milligrams per deciliter. If I am have a publishing deadline, I am not exercising, I've only walked 7,000 steps the day before, I maybe ate really late at night, I could easily bump up to 90 for my fasting glucose. So it's really fun to kind of see like how much the health behaviors translate into the more optimal fasting glucose range. Because of course, if you extrapolate that over the course of a lifetime, that's the difference between developing, you know, moving more down the spectrum of problems or not. And so nothing has been really more motivating to me than seeing how much fasting glucose um, can really bounce around and just making sure that I'm doing the various things that keep it um, in that lower end of normal so that I can hopefully stay there for the rest of my, my life. I love how you said the lower end of normal. It's interesting. I often wonder about ketogenic diets and beta cell dysfunction over time. I don't know if you've read about that, but oftentimes if insulin is not stimulated over a period of time, I believe that there is some destruction to those pancreatic beta cells. So perhaps adding some kind of carbohydrate in rather than chronically doing a ketogenic diet uh, may be of some benefit to allow for if an individual goes off of a ketogenic diet that the body still is able to manage and mitigate blood glucose levels from carbohydrate load. Would you say that that's accurate? I I think so. I think that um, it really comes down to the metabolic flexibility. Like You can become metabolically inflexible because you're too carb dominant, but also because you're you know, too, too fat dominant. And so I think this is where the concepts around like carb cycling, um, come in and, you know, I, but I I would say, I don't think we really know in terms of like from a fasting blood sugar perspective, like exactly what optimal means if you are on a more extreme, extreme diet. Um, and so, but yes, I, I would say that, um, it's like with all biologic systems, like ultra rigidity, um, tends to be less, uh, favorable, um, than a more like harmonious interplay between different poles. So, um, that kind of, I think plays to the idea of, you know, uh, giving your body the ability to kind of work various pathways and and actually focusing on metabolic flexibility. I love that. Very important. There is something to be said for, inclusion of all kinds of foods over 
periods of time. And I th- we're seeing that in the evidence, whether it is if someone is uh, following a carnivore style diet, there is benefit, clearly benefit to fiber and phytonutrients. We know that there are multiple low molecular weight um, molecules like creatine and, and serine, all kinds of things that you can't get from one or the other group. When it comes to foods over that now, how large is, are you able to say how large the data set is for levels? Well, in terms of um, people who have used the program, it's been um, somewhere around 50,000 people in terms of, so people who join the levels program, um, there it, you can opt in to an IRB approved research study. Um, and that number I actually don't have off the top of my head, but there is a subset of that that has actually entered a research study where we can actually look at the data. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Before we talk about the foods that relate to blood sugar, I think that it's important to, to mention postprandial mean after feeding glucose disposal. So what is the body in a, again, I hate to say healthy sedentary, but a sedentary individual, what does that kind of look like? To maintain blood sugar at 85 milligrams per deciliter, we are looking at two grams per hour for the brain. Organs are about two grams per hour. Muscle is, is around two to three grams per hour. I know most people are shocked by that, but muscle is not extremely metabolically active. Glycogen deposition in the liver is about 30 grams. There is some gluconeogenesis. We don't really know what that number is. But basically, based on the literature calculations, sedentary individuals can dispose of around 20 grams per two hours and 30 grams over two hours. Ultimately, well, it ends up being 50 grams post-meal, 50 grams disposal. Total post-meal disposal ends up being about 50 grams over two hours. I am so grateful that Bite Toothpaste decided to sponsor this episode of the show. If it's one new product that I strongly recommend you try, it is Bite. They have toothpaste, they have mouthwash, and it comes in refillable glass jars. I have a little silver container. They even have soap. All of this stuff is low footprint. It doesn't have a ton of packaging. It is clean. Okay, so let me tell you about the toothpaste and let me tell you about the mouthwash. It is in a small, it's almost like a Tic Tac. You pop it in your mouth, chew it up, don't swallow it. You put some water in and bam, you have your mouthwash. So you don't have to have stinky breath and you don't have to travel with mouthwash. There you have it. The same goes for toothpaste. Pop it in your mouth, crunch it up, put some water in, brush your teeth, spit it out. So this is a dry toothpaste made with clean ingredients. It's sulfate-free, palm oil-free, and glycerin-free. It comes in refillable glass jars, and it comes in compostable pouches, so they're better for the environment. No more plastic toothpaste bottles. I strongly recommend you check this out. Bite is offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Go to trybite.com slash Dr. Lion or use the code Dr. Lion at checkout to get this deal. Oh, that's so interesting. So, I <laughs> Yes. So here's why I'm bringing this up. Because oftentimes when we talk about what does it look like for designing a meal and keeping blood sugar regulation steady, I always tell my patients, and I write about this in my book, between 40 to 50 grams max if not related to exercise, because you have to be able, because the the numbers for glucose disposal, typically uh, it's 50 grams over two hours. It takes about two hours. Yeah. So I just wanted to lay that out there as people are, I'm sure that they are going to be playing with uh, blood glucose monitors and seeing. So I want to see if that literature data actually makes sense with what you are seeing. Yeah, it's so interesting. So 50 grams over two hours does feel right. There's so much variability to it, of course, because, you know, I'm assuming, is that in a insulin sensitive individual? Like an optimal? Yeah. So I mean, normal insulin sensitive individual, baseline glucose disposal in a sedentary individual, you would not want to go over 50 grams per meal and assuming that they would be able to dispose of that. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I mean, I think it's 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 what's especially interesting is that like the average American now is not um, not insulin sensitive. You know, I would say probably most are not. But when you look at the data, so they have done several observational studies in people without diabetes where you basically just like throw on a glucose monitor on a population of like non-diabetic, so presumably insulin sensitive people and you give them various standardized meals or let them just walk around and eat normally. And, and these studies range from like three days to 30 days. And when you look at that, um, typically people, um, tend to peak around 60 or so minutes after eating and then come back down to normal by about two hours. Um, although I would say that for, the most insulin sensitive people, they tend to come down probably faster than two hours. Like they go up and come down before you actually reach the two hour mark. But if someone is going up after a meal and kind of floating above the baseline after two hours, like to me, that would be a very strong signal that this person is having issues clearing and clearing glucose from the bloodstream and probably has some underlying insulin resistance. So, um, you know, that kind of pattern of like a wide mountain spike would be concerning to me, um, versus a more like straight up, straight down. Um, and so, but yeah, I would say like, just like, anecdotally from, from levels data, you know, 45 minutes to an hour is, is about when people tend to peak and then come, come back down and be down to baseline before about 60 minutes. We haven't like fully analyzed or published all that data, but it, I would say it matches up pretty closely with the observational studies you see in healthy populations. But, you know, it's interesting. Like I, um, I think Something we focus about so much, I think, in the glucose, metabolic health, CGM conversation is like the inputs, like how much glucose is actually going in in the meal, which is such an important part and how it's balanced and how quickly it's being absorbed. Of course, like fiber, protein, fat is going to change the dynamics of how quickly the glucose is being absorbed. But I think like what has been so profound to me looking at the literature is actually like the other side of that coin. So how is it getting sucked out of the bloodstream? And that of course comes down to insulin sensitivity and muscle. And that's where I think like so much of the research is, is just so fascinating. Like we, we have done some research with our levels population showing how just basically walking after a meal has like a very significant impact on blood sugar levels. We, we gave, um, members uh, basically an experiment to do, um, where they drink a 12 ounce can of Coke, um, and basically just were sedentary after the can of Coke. And then we gave them a 12 ounce can of Coke the next day, ideally under very similar circumstances, like similar sleep, similar stress levels, et cetera. And then they just had to take basically a brisk walk, um, after the meal and, or uh, after the Coke. And we actually saw that the, the glucose peak was, uh, went from 162 milligrams per deciliter on average to 132 milligrams per deciliter on average. So just taking like a simple walk after the meal, activating the muscles to basically, you know, pull the glucose out and actually process it, um, had a fairly robust response on that peak glucose level. And, um, and that that represented about an eighteen percent decrease in peak glucose levels. So um, I think if you extrapolate that over the course of a lifetime, like the simple act of just taking a walk after a meal, um, you know, could be very, very, very powerful um, as sort of this, uh, uh, you know, as you talk about so much, like this incredible glucose glucose sink. Um, and of course there's insulin, insulin independent mechanisms of getting glucose out of the bloodstream with muscle activation. And so it's almost like a freebie. So that's, I mean, of all the things we've learned, I think one of the biggest ones is take a short walk after a meal, 10, 15, 20 minutes, ideally after every meal. And it's essentially like getting the best bang for your buck, um, from, from a meal. So I would say, yeah, certainly walking, um, it's so simple, but so much like hordes of research literature, I think support that it's one of the walking a lot throughout the day, um, the low level movement and that constant simulation of, you know, AMPK and these different pathways, um, is, is very important for kind of keeping the body constitutively moving through glucose, as opposed to just chunking it in one exercise block. Um, which of course is going to be very different physiology than low grade movement throughout the entire day. And I really like to think about it as like you have, you can either 
constantly be triggering these pathways to keep working, keep bringing the the glute forward, you know, keep, keep bringing glute forward to the cell membrane all throughout the day, or you can chunk it. And ideally, we'd have intense exercise in a chunk, but also this low grade movement uh, throughout the day. So I think that's one of like the biggest takeaways I've seen from both the levels data, but also just like the general research literature about about walking. That's very valuable. That's very valuable for anyone listening, because regardless of where you're starting, everybody can move. And whether it's walking or push-ups or squats, it yeah. is post-meal disposal, leveraging skeletal yes. muscle, very critical, independent of insulin. So what Casey is saying is that you can move blood glucose out of the bloodstream into skeletal muscle, independent of insulin. And that is incredible because we know that muscle accounts for 70 plus percent of glucose disposal. You had mentioned, um, well, there's a few things that I really want to talk about. I'm curious as if there's very particular foods that surprised you. I'm curious about what you're seeing with alcohol. Again, I know that it's very difficult because typically individuals are not eat, drinking a Coke, right? Or if you are, shame on you. <laughs> I'm kidding. But do you... I, are there certain foods that you see that surprised you? For example, I don't know, a banana or um, any, any food in particular that surprised you with its increase in glucose? Yeah, I, I think the foods that have been most surprising to me um, are breakfast foods, to be honest. I think that one of the biggest deltas we see between like a healthy response and an unhealthy response really happens with breakfast because so many American breakfast foods are so heavy on refined carbohydrates and refined sugar. And the so some of the breakfast food responses are the highest we see in our entire data set. And it's often when like certain words are mentioned in the log. Um, because of course, you know, this is not, it's very like you said, it's hard to parse this data because people are eating lots of different things together. So it's not, it's not like it's clean data, but like generally speaking, when you have words that are within the log, like juice, donut, pastry, toast, croissant, muffin, bagel, uh, cereal, cereal is is like a, a real disaster in terms of glucose response in the data set. Cereal of almost all kinds, even the ones that kind of masquerade as like healthy, um, tend to have you know some of these very large glucose responses. And the the but then on the flip side, some of the more balanced breakfasts that we see logged, so phrases like eggs and avocado, um, even like. Uh, eggs and greens, frittata, uh, chia pudding, almond butter, like these are types of words that, you know, when you see the, the, the patterns of those words tend to be some of the lowest glucose responses. So I, it just feels like based on what we're seeing, there's this huge opportunity with breakfast to really, and I'm, I'm one thing I hope is that some of this, as this levels data becomes more organized and we can hopefully get more of it out there, that it'll really help push culture forward to, I mean, we all know that like, refined grains and sugars are not good. But when you kind of see these like significant patterns of, um, of, of logs that include these terms being really huge spikers and the ones that are much more balanced, having such low glucose responses, it really shows you how much it can really set you up for success if you make those, those, um, ladder choices. And so, um, yeah, so some of the breakfasts that have been consistently low spikers would be the things like eggs and avocado, eggs and greens, frittata, chia pudding. Um, often those are paired with low, low glycemic fruits like berries and almond butter. And then we see uh, a lot of people, one of our advisors is Kelly Levesque, and we see a lot of people uh, logging her smoothie, which is called the Fab Four smoothie. I love and Kelly, by the way. Just she's her incredible. Email yesterday. Oh. Yeah. Just she's her. such an amazing, but she's really popularized this very simple recipe, which um, I think is emblematic of what a balanced meal can look like, which is essentially it's very high protein. It's very high um, it's high fat, you know, it, they, it, she puts like, she's not afraid of fat, you know, almond butter, um, people can use whole milk, whatever, um, fiber and greens. And so it's a smoothie that's like quite well balanced and isn't going to just sort of like load your, and th those tend to be, you know, less than 15 milligram per deciliter spikes, uh, for breakfast. So, um, so I'd say breakfast is a huge opportunity. Um, we also see like in terms of some of the very, very worst things in the data set, I would say cereal is up there, but also, um, 
very specific. And, and then of course, soda, um, but very specific, um, types of candies. So at one point, and I'm not sure if this still holds true, but like the very, very, very worst food in the data set was Skittles. And this is so not surprising. Like it's a, all candy is, you know, not going to be optimal for our sort of cellular biology, but these, these candies that are like naked carbohydrates, like they don't even really have any fat or protein. Like you look at a Snickers bar and there's actually some like fat and protein in it to kind of maybe slow the absorption of glucose. But a Skittle or a something like um, a lollipop or a um, like a Starburst or something like these that just are just straight sugar macronutrient, fo- you know, focused. Um, they tend to be some of the the absolute worst. And so, uh, <laughs> if I were to eat candy, it would definitely push me towards eating like a more balanced candy, like a. Uh, maybe a one with nuts um, or something like that, as opposed to these just like straight injections of sugar into the bloodstream. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. Please head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for 20% off. Again, I love Inside Tracker. Again, this topic of conversation, we are talking all about glucose regulation, insulin. You should know your numbers. You can do that by heading on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. You can get a daily action plan with personalized guidance, the right way to exercise, nutrition, supplementation. But most important, Inside Tracker has made a ton of strides this year and they've added new biomarkers for health. For example, if you have not done your ApoB, you should. It's critical for heart health. I see this all the time. You guys have to know your number as well as three hormone markers that are incredibly important as it relates to aging. Now Inside Tracker is doing insulin, which is a key biomarker. We talk all about that in this episode for sustained energy and early warning signs for several chronic diseases. Inside Tracker is an incredible company. There's multiple things in their store that you can pick from depending on what you want. I strongly recommend every four months or so that you get your blood work done because you have to know if what you're doing is working. So head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion and you will get 20% off your entire order. I like that. So basically you're saying if you're going to make a bad choice, make a bad choice wisely. I can appreciate that. Also what you are seeing in the data set and what we know in some of the literature out of Heather Lighty's lab talking about Combination meals, protein first, not breakfast skipping, really changes the impulse to eat later on in the day. People really care about weight loss. People care about weight loss. People care about weight loss as it relates to blood sugar regulation, not being hungry. Absolutely agree with you in terms of that first meal of the the day. The data would support that that is actually the most critical. And while individuals typically have fasted for that first meal, I believe we're going to start to see a shift coming back to actually eating earlier on and stopping eating earlier rather than fis- than uh, pushing that fasting window. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, and one key reason for this of why like, I think breakfast is – is so important um, to get right if you are going to eat breakfast is because the research is showing that it's it's the crash after a spike that is often when we see people have the most cravings for high calorie, high carbohydrate foods. So if you have a very high glucose spike, um, basically the body is going to respond by releasing a lot of insulin and, you know, trying to soak all that glucose out of the bloodstream. And that can often lead to a post-meal crash, which the technical term for is reactive, reactive hypoglycemia. And there was actually a paper that I think was published in Nature, like uh, in the last couple of years, that basically looked at um, the time when you're crashing. So going below baseline, which is kind of how a reactive hypoglycemia is defined, that is when people are often have the highest cravings for like carbohydrate meals and the extent of reactive hypoglycemia can actually predict how much people are going to eat later in the day. And also and so, not to interrupt you, this yeah. is our patients. These are our patients who are waking up in the middle of the night to eat. Yes. You guys, the people that have, and it's so interesting, binge eating disorder, night waking 
and going to the kitchen and eating and not remembering it. We see this with individuals. We put a a monitor on them and they're having reactive hypoglycemia. It makes, yeah, it makes total sense because that is actually sort of like a primitive fear signal for the body of like, I'm starving and I need to get my glucose back up to baseline. And so in many, like it's, it's, it's physiologically understandable by why someone would have this sense of, I need to get up out of bed to like stabilize my blood sugar. Um, if it's crashing, um, and the much better option of course, is to not have the crash in the first place, which, um, which of course can be done through so many different ways. Um, uh, balancing the meals properly, like you were talking about having, you know, protein, and fat before eating carbohydrates in the meal. So sequencing the meal properly, obviously avoiding refined grains and refined sugars as much as you can, because those are going to spike the glucose and eating. If you're going to eat carbohydrates, eat more complex carbohydrates that are paired well with fat and fiber. Um, and so, you know, I think we, you hear a lot of patients talk about how they might be dealing with hypoglycemia, like, oh, I have problems with low blood sugar. But I think what people don't maybe understand until they put on a CGM is that the reason, one of the reasons they might be having hypoglycemia and the symptoms associated with that, like cravings and jitteriness and anxiety and um, a lot of uh, subjective experiences, low energy that we know are associated with your active hypoglycemia is because it was preceded by a spike. So figuring out how to modulate and smooth that out, um, can be really, really helpful. Um, and I was just double checking that paper that, that, that I, I was mentioning, it was in nature metabolism and it was actually from April, 2021. It's called postprandial glycemic dips, predict appetite and energy intake in healthy individuals. So it's like a pretty relevant, title to, to almost anyone who's dealing with kind of like that that hunger urge and constant urge to eat throughout the day. And so stabilizing, you can imagine if you start the day with a huge spike and crash, can you imagine how much that's setting up your day for basically problems? Because you crash, then you eat something to bring it up, then you spike again, and then you crash, and then you're on the roller coaster versus just keeping it more stable throughout the day. Yeah, that's very important for individuals because when you're setting yourself up for failure, Uh, These are primitive mechanisms that are going to be deployed. And, you know, we want individuals to be successful. What are some of the states in which individuals will see variability that they may not be expecting? For example, are there changes when someone starts testosterone therapy? Are there changes when someone starts uh, the pill during menstruation, ovulation, you know, men, women, are there certain times where we see more flux than perhaps we anticipated? Great question. Yeah, I think there's definitely several several sort of physiologic scenarios where people might see ups and downs in the absence of of really food changes that can sometimes be very confusing, but most are very physiologically understandable. And many actually aren't. Um, the it, it is not clear from the research that some of these spikes are actually problematic. Um, so I think one of the ones that you know, you've probably seen a lot um, in, in patients maybe wearing CGM is that when people do really intense, high intensity interval training activities where they're getting their heart rate up to, you know, 80% or above of their max heart rate um, or an elevated VO2 max, although most people aren't checking that while they're working out all the time. So it's more like heart rate as a proxy uh, or sort of like power, like power lifting, basically anything that's like the, the most intense exercise you can do. We often see people having like a significant very sharp glucose rise, even if they're fasted. And the reason for this is because these these exercises uh, can release catecholamines and cortisol and stress hormones. And essentially, those hormones can then tell the liver that the body's in need of extra you know, fuel to fuel the muscles and cause glycogen glycogenolysis from the liver and release glycogen into the bloodstream very quickly to essentially fuel this you know, this, this exercise. And so this is one of those spikes where it's physiologic and it, it, I, I have not been convinced by any research that I've seen that this is necessarily bad for the body over time. Um, if you're doing like a moderate amount of hit training per week, um, over, there's been some research that shows that over 150, I believe it was 152 minutes of, of high intensity interval training per week. Actually, you could start to see, a. uh, 
sort of a decrement in the benefits in terms of like mitochondrial health and whatnot. But I don't think there's that many people who are doing 150 minutes of HIIT training per week. So for the average person, I think we're probably in a safe zone. And so that glucose, I think we know that those exercises over almost immediately improve insulin sensitivity and over the long term, like are positive for overall um, metabolic glucose dynamics. And so even though you're seeing that spike it's very different than a food spike because it's a feed forward, you know, you're, you're releasing that glucose and then you're processing it into, you know, ATP and actually using it for energy. And you're likely getting a lot of it out of the bloodstream through these insulin independent mechanisms. And so all of that is just very different physiology than a, than a, than a food related glucose spike. So that's one, um, that you see spikes in the absence of food. Another one is, um, uh, different phases of the menstrual cycle. So people, and this is, uh, we know that people tend to be more insulin sensitive in the follicular phase of their cycle than the luteal phase of their cycle. We tend to become slightly physiologically insulin resistance during resistant during the um, luteal phase of the cycle. Um, and this may have something to do with the balance of estrogen and progesterone during that that phase of the cycle. Um, and so people will sometimes find that they spike higher to food um, in the luteal phase uh, That's because they're a little bit less carb sensitive. or I'm sorry, they're a little bit more uh, glucose intolerant or carb sensitive. And it's subtle, but we definitely have heard some reports of that. And, and the, so I'm not sure if that's something you've... Um, do you think it's significant? as it relates to body composition over time or managing hunger, just out of curiosity? I don't know if it is, I think, I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head, but but the in terms of like how fasting glucose changes from follicular to luteal, from what I recall from the research, it's like less than 10 milligrams per deciliter in terms of shift in fasting glucose. Um, like it's, it's small numbers, but there's something there. Um, and the way I kind of approach it is just thinking more about um, how to how to make sure I'm supporting my glucose disposal during that phase of the cycle. So being just a little bit more dialed in with, um, you know, I, I don't want excess glucose sitting in my bloodstream, you know, no matter what is going on. So do I maybe take like a very gentle like walk after my meals, maybe for a little bit longer during that phase of the cycle? Or, you know, do I just really make sure I'm getting optimal sleep so that I'm not going to be hitting myself with insulin resistance from these other mechanisms like like stress or or sleep deprivation because we know both stress and sleep deprivation can acutely cause insulin resistance like the next day. So just making sure that of all these different levers you can pull, you're not kind of adding more fuel to the fire if there's already a physiologic sort of hormonal reason for why you might be slightly less insulin sensitive. So mm-hmm. um, the other ones, like I just mentioned, sleep and stress, both, both can cause people to have glucose changes in their di- changes in the dynamics of their glucose. Um, we see a lot of members reporting that when they're having an acute stress stressor, like uh, getting up and speaking in front of people or presenting at work or something like that, or having a fight um, with a loved one, that they often will see a glucose rise. That's those similar mechanisms of stress hormones and catecholamine release causing glycogenolysis. That I would say is probably not a healthy uh version of this physiology because you're not actually using the muscles to clear that glucose in that stressful situation, right? Like you having a fight with, you know, your partner and, you know, going back and forth or giving a talk, like you might be having that release of glucose into the bloodstream, but there's no sink for it. It's just, so that that's where, uh, unless you go take a walk or work out or something, you're going to probably need to release insulin to actually clear the glucose. So that's going to probably be one. And and it, it, it makes sense. We know that chronic stress over time and chronic sleep deprivation both are very bad for metabolic health. So, um, and then there's certain medications that can definitely cause glucose issues. So like, uh, corticosteroids. So the steroids, like they were prescribing for so many patients in the ear, nose and throat world, um, tend to cause, um, pretty significant glucose elevations. Um, and it's, it's wild actually to see how high, and it's something I've talked to a lot of my surgeon friends about because a lot of anesthesiologists and surgeons will actually just give, you know, IV steroids before, after a surgical procedure for several reasons. Like one is because it can help with pain after surgery. It can help with just general inflammation after the, you know, on the surgical site. But I think it's something we actually need to dig 
deeper into as like a medical community because um, I think if you put CGMs on patients postoperatively and just looked at what was happening for the week after surgery with their blood sugar after giving them those IV doses of steroids, we'd probably find that it's like monumentally elevated. Of course, we just don't like see that because we're not putting these CGMs on people. But I think there's there's probably some more digging we need to do into that because steroids are just profound elevators of of uh, of blood sugar, whether it's like an oral steroid course or an IV. I would say less so with certainly like nasal steroids, like a Flonase, um, and definitely almost ne- nothing with a topical steroid. But but if but oral and IV is is pretty pronounced. And I'll just mention, you know, when I think about muscle centric medicine, we do think about medications that create issues, oral steroids, that is on it. Oral steroids induce insulin resistance. They do this by inhibiting GLUT4 transporters in the muscle. It can cause a 30 to 50% reduction in insulin-stimulated glucose uptake, 70% reduction in insulin-stimulated glycogen synthesis. That's a problem. And we know whether the chicken or the egg, you know, where is the actual defect? There's probably multiple areas of challenges within the body, whether it's glycogen synthesis, whether it's, um, you know, reduced insulin synthesis, any of those things, oral steroids actually contribute to many of them, nearly all of them. So from insulin resistance, inhibiting the transporters, uh, reduction in the stimulation of glycogen synthesis, reduction of insulin synthesis. So there are issues. Have you seen, and that's so interesting because as an ENT, again, one of the things that you were always prescribing, not always, but for an acute itis, we give patients corticosteroids. And then someone would say, okay, well, they are having an inflammatory reaction. You do need it to treat it. I absolutely agree with you. That may be a time in which we change their diet. It may also be a time where we do monitor their glucose, especially if it's cyclical and their cyclical need, whether they're an asthmatic or whatever that individual is needing. Do PPIs also, are there other things uh, that change blood sugar? Um, you know, we can talk about GLP, GLP-1s, we can talk about metformin, but I'm just curious from an ENT perspective, were there other things or had you thought of other things? Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. Today, I'm going to highlight one of my favorite supplements, and that is micronized creatine monohydrate. Creatine is super important, and oftentimes we think that we get enough. But I will tell you that women typically have lower creatine stores in the body. Why is this important? Well, it's easy to supplement with creatine. And not only is it an amazing source of energy, especially your body uses creatine in periods of stress or exertion, endurance activities, anaerobic capacity. Creatine is utilized for performance and energy. But what's so amazing about creatine is that we're seeing it positively influence the brain, cognitive capacity. And that is amazing. This really kind of interfaces the muscle brain connection. On one hand, we think about explosive power and strength, supporting ATP utilization, increasing muscle mass, cell volume. And on the brain side, we think about improvements in cognitive efficiency and thinking and somewhat of brain protection. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. And you can get your own first form micronized creatine monohydrate. Yeah. You know, when you think about medications or really any substance that's going into the body, it's it's interesting because there's some medications that are going to acutely affect blood sugar, either bringing it up or or bringing it down. And that's something you can really like see on the continuous glucose monitor. And that like steroids is the perfect example of that. Like uh, you put them on it and like within hours, someone's glucose might be going floating up into the abyss, which is kind of what it looks like. It just starts floating up and it just like stays up there. Then there's other medications. People might start metformin and 
th- two days later, they notice their glucose has just like frame shifted down or something like that. So there's there's d- drugs like, but then there's all these other drugs that I think you know that we practice that we prescribe in in medicine that don't necessarily have that direct impact on the blood sugar that you're going to see on a continuous glucose monitor, but we know that they function in a way that overall can hurt the the metabolic milieu in the cell through many different ways. Um, and so there's there's medications that are maybe microbiome disruptors and therefore are going to change the short chain fatty acid sort of production and balance in the body, which has downstream effects on on metabolic regulation. There's some that are going to be like direct mitochondrial disruptors. And it's amazing how many different ways medications that we prescribe can hurt the mitochondria from depleting ATP in the cell, from actually depleting a mitochondrial cofactor like coenzyme Q10, like blocking ATP synthase, like blocking specific protein complexes in the electron transport chain. Um, And so those aren't going to necessarily cause you to have like a glucose issue the next day, but they're going to be kind of slowly and more insidiously creating a foundation of metabolic issues in the cell that, of course, may down the road then lead to more glucose uh, intolerance. And so I think that's a real journey that we all need to go on as a healthcare system is like really thinking about all of us taking ownership of like protecting the metabolic health or the the mitochondrial sort of health of our patients, as well as the microbiome health and all the different things that interplay and, and make sure we're understanding what those risks are. But like some of the drugs, for instance, like, you know, there's like, certainly like, like, uh, statins, for instance, like are known to, um, deplete like coenzyme Q10, which is one of the key uh, cofactors related to the electron transport chain. So this might like underlie some of why people have side effects with this uh, medi- with this medication, like myopathies, and also um, why supplementing coenzyme Q10 might be helpful with people taking um, uh, statins. Certain A lot of antidepressants like fluoxetine, antipsychotic drugs, uh, clozapine, um, these um, are known to have mitochondrial effects. Now, actually, there was a really interesting study that came out last year that one of our medical advisors at Levels, Dr. Robert Lustig, um, was an author on about this concept of obesogens. So now that we're starting to understand what the mechanisms of how some of these medications actually hurt uh, mitochondrial health um, or metabolic processes, they're now being classed as medications called obesogens, meaning that we know that they actually causatively are related to obesity by the way they impact metabolism. And so on that list would be certain like antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs. There's certain um, antibiotics, uh, chemotherapy agents like cisplatin, pain medications, aspirin, NSAIDs, Tylenol, some diuretics. Um, So just a lot of medications that in some way have either direct or secondary effects on these pathways that, again, can be direct mitochondrial inhibition, microbiome related, or the way in which they impact epigenetic um, modifications that can then have downstream effect on metabolic pathways. So um, so just really something I think, so no blanket statements here about like what to take, what not to take, but like more like these are questions to probe with your doctor about like what are the unintended consequences of what I'm taking so that we can have like a real risk benefit conversation because, um, you know, many people do end up coming off these medications and the side effects that we should be exhausting all, of course, non-pharmacological, um, avenues like diet and lifestyle, um, in, in addition to, of course, grabbing our, our prescription pad. Absolutely agree with that. What else would you like to talk about? Anything really on your mind that you would love to talk about? Oh, it's a great question. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours about metabolic health. I think that, um, you know, I just um, kind of, I I think one thing that I've been reflecting on just with this conversation, we started out talking about ENT, like, I think that one really interesting thing that I think people might not be aware of is that some of these conditions that are being treated and like, very specific parts of the body, um, like the head and neck, like things like migraine or sinusitis or hearing loss. Um, I think the average person and the average doctor like has no idea how these are related to 
sort of wider metabolic dynamics in the body. And um, I think it's really, it's, it's unfortunately, it's something that's really a blind spot in a lot of the surgical subspecialties. But when you actually dig into the research, you see some really interesting, like, more correlational and like epidemiologic data about like the risk of some of these like specialized diseases with uh, being so much higher in people who have underlying metabolic issues. So one thing that I was, you know, really shocked by was looking into the research is that if someone has high blood sugar, um, like type two diabetes, they're almost three times more likely to suffer from chronic sinusitis. And so that's like an area where we can really like dig into a little bit and like talk to people about, Hey, like if you, if you are, people can be chronically debilitated by chronic sinusitis and be really motivated to do whatever they can to kind of get on top of that. And so if there's an avenue there of like stabilizing blood sugar, you know, improving insulin sensitivity that can actually help with that, like it's really worth talking to patients about. Similar with actually hearing loss, which is you know one of one of so, such a common complaint in um, the ger. I mean, you, I know you you've trained as a geriatrician, and like it's it's really debilitating to people. And usually, the way that we talk about it is like, oh, it's you're getting older, and you know, you went to too many loud concerts in your youth, um, but it's actually really clear that elevating fasting glucose um, confers a much, much higher risk of losing your hearing, high frequency hearing um, earlier in life and having a more severe case of it. So uh, people with um, elevated fasting glucose levels um, had 40, there were the prevalence of high frequency hearing loss was 42% in that population compared to 24% in people with normal fasting glucose levels. And this makes sense. The, the, the hearing is one of a very metabolically demanding, um, very, uh, process in the body. It's very complex signal processing. Um, and it's very small parts of the body. So like the hair cells that actually the, the cells that do hearing uh in the ear are called hair cells and and they're fed by extremely extremely small blood vessels and so glycation blood sugar sticking to things endothelial dysfunction related to insulin sensitivity uh, nitric oxide signaling these things in these small vessels with really high energy processing needs in in parts of the body like the ear are of course going to be exquisitely sensitive to metabolic function but I've never heard the words blood sugar metabolic health or hearing loss really ever be mentioned in the same conversation in the ENT world so that's one area that's like just there's so much opportunity to empower patients, um, you know, to, to essentially really dial in diet and lifestyle in hopes of keeping metabolic health and blood sugar levels under better control. Um, another one that we saw a lot in my field was like people with migraines, which can be again, very debilitating, um, affect women more than men. And there's a lot more coming out now around like the neuroenergetic theory of migraines. Um, they've, they've been very poorly understood, but like two pathways that seem to be emerging as more, um, maybe mechanistic causes are excess oxidative stress because the brain is exquisitely sensitive to excess oxidative stress and also, um, essentially neuroenergetic. So not the, the brain, certain regions of the brain, not having the, um, having excess energy demands for what it's able to produce. And for a long time, there's been interesting research showing that certain supplements actually may be helpful for migraine. And it's things like vitamin B12 and coenzyme Q10 and magnesium and lipoic acid and actually even L-carnitine. And when and and sort of always been like a question of like oh well i wonder why like that's kind of interesting but it's like when you look these are all mitochondrial cofactors <laughs> so they are all involved in the actual like either the electron transport chain or um how we shuttle substrates into the mitochondria and so really just speaking more broadly it's like the metabolic lens on any subspecialty i think just opens up such a like a world of um opportunity for potential areas that we can empower our patients and um and help them dial in some of their like lifestyle strategies with a with like showing where to point the spear essentially and cuz i think people like you know if they're just like oh i need to eat healthier and i need to exercise more it's 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 maybe less compelling than helping people understand really where they're like what they're trying to achieve with this so i would say just for any subspecialist who might be listening, it's like, 
get on PubMed and start to like look at some of these different links that we may not may not be like in our guidelines, but actually might be something that you you have to kind of search for different things. Like if you're an orthopedic surgeon, for instance, like start looking up things more like oxidative stress and osteoarthritis or mitochondrial dysfunction and osteoarthritis or things like that, that start to open up a whole set of literature that, um, yeah, is just not, not necessarily what we're learning about in our conventional training or practice. Well, Casey means you are really leading the charge. And I know that the whole community is just so incredibly grateful to you. Like I was saying before we were recording, so many people just really love you. And uh, I'm very excited to have you on the podcast. I will link where everyone can find you. I know that you have a newsletter that's called Casey's Kitchen. By the way, we should collaborate. Do you know that I recently lost, launched a 30 G's uh, recipe newsletter? And this was from our mutual friend, Drew Pruitt's idea. I would love to have you on as a guest for contributing to a 30 gram G recipe. So if anyone is listening, please go sign up for your 30 G's and Casey will be one of the guest recipe providers. But anyway. I love that. <laughs> I am learning from you so much on Instagram about uh, I new ideas for the 30 grams meals. Like it's just, it's so, th they're incredibly helpful. <laughs> so please keep, I'm so happy to know about the newsletter because yeah, your life really opens up and gets better when you start learning how to incorporate 30 plus grams of protein into every meal. What an unlock. Yeah, totally. So you guys, we can't, I can't wait to host you as a, a collaborator. So we're definitely doing that. Now, where can people find you? I will also say Levels has an amazing blog. Um, so please share yeah, with us. Thank you. We're very proud of our blog. We invest a huge amount of energy and um, have many experts, you know, on the blog, essentially synthesizing the most recent research literature to be as understandable as possible. So levelshealth.com slash blog. Um, and uh, we also do post a lot about like things we're learning from the data set and what members are experiencing about how to stabilize their blood sugar levels on our Twitter and Instagram at levels. Um, and I am at Dr. Casey's Kitchen on Instagram and, and Twitter. Um, and yeah, I recommend signing up for the Levels newsletter and checking out the blog. There's lots of lots of great information there. And when is your book coming out, by the way? It comes out next May. So okay. as as you know, these publishing processes are a long time. So the book is done, but uh, it comes out and comes out in May. So just under a year. And I'm so excited for your book co coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a total process. So I'm excited uh, to have you back on to talk about your book. That is going to be great. Dr. Casey Means, I will see you in LA very soon. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you.